Hello, I'm Melissa Hansen, and this is my colleague, Maria Garcia. I'm the content editor for Cinema.com. Maria is a film critic for several magazines, including Cineast and Film Journal. We're very happy today to speak with Julia Lochte, who has uh, the, who is the writer director for The Loneliest Planet, which was featured in last year's New York Film Festival and is also in theaters Friday, October 26th. Thank you for having me. Hi. Hi. Oh, it's delightful to meet you. Um, I guess if we could begin with um, just a reference to your first film, which was a documentary, um, Moment of Impact. Um, could you speak just to introduce you to the audience, um, maybe why you decided to, to become a filmmaker, and why you made the choice to uh, have your first film be a documentary about your family? Well, I actually went to film school thinking I would do fiction films, and that's what I've ended up doing. I never thought that I would be making a documentary, but I think it is the thing that people say, you know, starting from what you know. And to mm. me, the story of my father and my mother, it's a film about how my father was hit by a car mm. and how my family's life was transformed was something I knew better than anything else in the world. Mm. So it somehow seemed like the place to start with. Okay. So. Okay. Well, you said you had uh, Hani Furstenberg in mind for the role. Uh, can you talk about casting her? Well, not, you know, not when I was writing it, but somehow mm -hmm. once I saw her, she seemed so right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I can ever answer, like, people ask, you know, why did you choose this actor or that actor? And it's just a feeling. It's like falling <laughs> in love. You say, like, why? And, you know, she's an amazing, amazing actress. It's funny that you described it as a film about a woman. I always say it's a film about three people or certainly a film about a couple. Mm -hmm. But I was very conscious, um, you know, not thinking about like a film about this woman and her fiance, but thinking about them from both the perspective of both characters and also, you know, with this character, the guy. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's a there's a moment in this when we're speaking about uh, Hani. Mm -hmm. um, she's she's got red hair. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's uh, I, I know throughout the film, at the beginning of the film especially, she has her hair down, it's free flowing, she's very, you know, loose and casual. And then, you know, after the incident in the middle of the movie, she, her hair kind of is pulled back and she kind of, it almost feels more reserved. Is, is that something that equated in there at all? It's funny, sometimes like so people observe things that I've never seen myself, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really followed that. But hey, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I like about making movies is that, you know, there's all sorts of things mm -hmm. in a film that someone else can, paths someone can take through it, you know, that I might not see. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, the thing with the red hair, I know, struck me because to me, when I think of someone with red hair, how they stand out, and there's like almost a certain vulnerability to that color, you know. And um, there's this wonderful shot that I guess I can bring up Robert Persson here. Um, <laughs> there's this wonderful shot at the beginning when they're first going on the truck, and you have just their three heads from the back. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if Robert Bresson was shooting that movie, that's precisely the way he would have framed that. Um, there's something about the back of the head that is so much more effective. Um, and there's something very intimate about the back of yes. somebody's head, the back of your lover's head. Yes. Especially, you know, I also tried to imagine that from the perspective of her fiancé, probably her red hair is something that is very intimate and kind of something that's so her that you know that it's so then later when you can't reach her right it's so much about the back of her head and this kind of this thing that is he's so used to touching and so used to being close but now he can't get close to it mm -hmm. so there's something very romantic about kind of the back of a woman's head especially I think mm -hmm. okay um, could you talk a little bit about influence? Are you influenced by Robert Bresson's movie? I, I love Bresson. I mean, that's something... <laughs> we sort of denied it as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Influence. I mean, it's sort of, um, for me, one of the most important filmmakers. But I'm also attracted to kind of strangely very opposite things, you know. Um, I mean, I love Brian De Palma, too. So, you know, so I kind of go <laughs> on very opposite um, okay. directions. Um, but there's other films that I thought of in terms of this film. One of them was Voyage in Italy, you know, the Rossellini film. Ah, um, okay. About a couple traveling, because I think travel 
place such the idea of travel and being out of your element is such an important part of the film. You know that it's about something that happens between this couple when they're completely outside of their usual universe, when they don't have their bearings, um, and how they try to find their bearings in this space, in this extremely emotional moment. Okay. Uh, could you talk a little about the location on the choosing uh, where you want to film it? Mm -hmm. Well, I initially, you know, the story is based on a short story by Tom Bissell, mm -hmm. and the short story was set in Kazakhstan. And you could set the story almost anywhere because, mm -hmm. you know, people hire guides to take them into the mountains while traveling in many parts of the world. For me, it was important that it was somewhere that we don't know a lot about, that we don't have an image of. For example, like, I haven't been to Peru, but I have a pretty good idea of what it looks like and have some ideas about, you know, it comes with a lot of kind of already associations. Most people with Georgia, they don't have any association whatsoever. They've heard of it, but beyond that, like, uh, is that in Russia? We're not sure, you know. <laughs> like, no, it's a separate country. And But I like that, that it was somewhere that we don't know. Um, but also, it's a very beautiful place. And, you know, both in terms of the people and the location. So, you know, it's one of the most gorgeous places I've ever been in my life. These mountains are kind of naked and huge and green and almost look like science fiction. But also it's a place where you can still travel and meet people. You know, there's not a very clear dynamic between, you know, travelers and people who work for them. It's not so strict. So people will offer to buy you a drink. They're very hospitable. You get invited to people's houses. And that kind of travel is, you know, my favorite kind of travel is when you actually get to meet people. So I wanted to set the film in that world. You know. Yeah, and there's that intimacy between the couple and Dato. And exactly. So, yeah. Is that how you met Dato? With, uh, is he, he's not an actor, right? No, so. he's a professional mountaineer. He's actually very famous in Georgia. He was stopped on the street much more than Gael. Um, <laughs> much more. I mean, everybody knows him because it's a mountainous country and he's the top mountaineer in Georgia. So he's climbed Everest twice, he's climbed Aconcagua. You know, he's climbed, he's wow. the summit at El Capitan in Yosemite. He's oh, wow. a very a very different character than actually um, the guide that he plays because he himself is like a professional technical mountaineer. Mm -hmm. The character he plays is a village mm -hmm. guide who guides trekkers for, for you know, for Vizina, what they do in the film is doesn't even count as hiking. It's like, that's kind of like a walk on the green stuff, you know? <laughs> it doesn't really count. And because of him, we also had a crew that was part mountaineers, so it was really like running it like a mountain expedition, and people who really knew the mountains. And you know, I also, I speak Russian, um, so I was able to kind of really communicate with people there very well, because most people still speak Russian, the older generation, certainly. Um, so we could really scheme things together and plot things together based on their intimate knowledge of this world. And you have a familial connection, right, with this area? Well, is I your mom from no, 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 I, no. I'm oh. from Russia. I'm from oh, St. Petersburg. Okay. But my parents went, you know, my parents went to Georgia before I was born. Uh, I remember seeing okay. pictures of them in Georgia. Uh, it was very much like the vacation paradise of the Soviet right. Union. So. Georgia has this kind of mythical place. Georgian men were like the Latin lovers of the Soviet oh, Union. Wow. Also. Um, so I grew up with this idea of Georgia. I hadn't been there, you know, until a few years before making the film. Wow. But there's still, even though, I mean, obviously a very separate country, and though there's has more than any other former Soviet Republic, they have the most tense relationship yeah, with Russia, Russia, obviously, and they're very strong, proud people. But there's still such a connection between former mm -hmm. Soviet states, mm -hmm. you know, where you have this shared past, you all grew mm -hmm. up on the same, you know, couple of TV shows, you see you share the language, right. so there's really, and that's going to change. I mean, eventually there isn't going to be that feeling, right. but still now, especially with people who are my age and older. Right. We felt that, that in the Ukraine. Path. In the Ukraine, where in Kiev, where they're, you know, they're speaking, the older people spoke Russian as well as Ukrainian. Well, I think both of us were uh, struck by the music in the film mm. uh, in, in kind of different ways, actually. Um, I more noticed it as the abruptness of, you know, when the music stopped, you know, from scene to scene. And, and for me, I kind of took that as, 
you know, you're, you're hearing this beautiful music and you're relaxing almost, and then it stops. And that kind of like is, is this kind of a theme throughout the film mm -hmm. for me. And we also notice that the music is um, almost always in the scenes where you're uh, in extreme long shot. Only in those scenes. Only in those scenes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and people are walking into the frame, yes, mostly. Sometimes uh, I think they're in sometimes, the frame already, sometimes but it's sort of, the it's the, we call them just kind of, we call them larva shots because they really, the characters become the size of larva. You really see how huge. Okay this landscape is because for me the challenge of the film is you're setting this incredibly delicate intimate story but in this enormous landscape and every once in a while I just wanted to like go so that you feel the space you know and you feel the kind of this whole thing is unfolding in this enormous expanse and I didn't want to have the in-between I didn't want to have like what's more a more conventional long shot where you see you know, the they're body. not conventional. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, oh, they're like way wider than you're used yeah, to seeing wide right. shots, you know. They're so extreme and they have this music and it's not just that they cut sharply pretty much. Um, I don't believe in dissol sound dissolves, so that's pretty yeah. much everything cuts sharply and <laughs> slightly mm -hmm. just abruptly, like I always mm -hmm. put the sound cut on the picture cut mm -hmm. and so you're just yeah. it's there. Very noticeable. I, yeah, I yeah. thought that was very effective. Yeah. 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 Um, we both sort of, sort of felt like yeah. it added a uh, the tension, you know, yes. to the you know to the narrative that was you know very um, very important. Yeah, I want to I don't I want to feel like those shifts in time and mood. I want to be like, okay, you're here, and now we're somewhere else. Right. And to feel really feel that rather than smooth it over. Um, did you feel like some of those shots too? Like when you were in extreme long shot, it was almost like an abstract painting. You know? We thought of them as that, yeah, exactly. And they don't have depth, they're very flat. The compositions okay. are, you know, very geometric and okay. abstract that you write about that, yeah. Well, I think um, it's interesting that you, I mean, we got that you were also trying to ask the question about masculinity. But I think maybe as women, uh, one of the things we felt was that title was so much about Hani. Um, that the loneliest planet sometimes is just being a woman. <laughs> and so um, uh, we wanted to know if maybe that was something you were thinking about. I don't, yeah, I don't have an answer. I mean, you know, the loneliest planet just seemed like an apt title for it. It's not the title of the short story, but somehow it seemed right because both in terms of, I mean, obviously it has that travel association. Mm -hmm. um, but Obviously, sometimes just the very simple thing of like sometimes you can feel much more alone being with the person you love than being alone. There are moments, you know, and I think that happens to all of us, you know, mm -hmm. to men, to women, to, you know, it just, there are those moments. Yeah. That, um, when I've done those trips, I mean, there have been times when um, I don't think my husband would not have made a decision like leaving me alone with the guide in the evening. And so that was one of the things that I honed in on in the film because we felt like there was that incident between the couple that is a withdrawal, obviously, of something on, on the man's part, a protection of sorts. And that Dato picks that up. Uh, he almost, you know, and so it seemed to us very logical that then Hani would sit at that fire with him. But there's this, the reason that we both felt like, I guess it was a woman's film, was um, because she's in this very tenuous position after the incident. Um, she wants to be very strong in the beginning. Um, she wants to be treated as an equal. But then once the incident happens, she's in this sort of nowhere, you know, no man's land, so to speak. And so yeah, I think they're both in this very vulnerable position, you know. I think okay. nobody in the film acts how they would like to have acted. Ah, I mean, okay. honestly, you know, okay. I don't think, you know, it's a, and they don't necessarily act how they would say they would act. I mean, it's interesting that you said, my husband would not do this. Mm. There's probably, each of those characters, like before what they do, they would probably say, I would not do this, or I would not do that, okay. or my husband, my fiance would not do this, or my mm -hmm. fiance would not do that. And I think that's really what the film is about, is that they do things at this moment mm -hmm. that they would never say they would do, yeah. and that they would never expect each other to do. And I think they're surprised 
by each other and by themselves. And that to me is kind of ultimately what the film is about and how they try to figure it out from there, you know. Because that's the worst thing is to kind of discover yourself acting like you said you would never ever yeah, do. True. The only other thing we haven't gotten to is, you know, why they don't argue. Mm. <laughs> so why don't they? I mean, why, is it why don't they just yell? Like, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. It's an interesting question. Why don't they? Because I think the question is, and what would they say? I mean, it's sometimes you know when you know somebody, when everybody knows everything in a mm-hmm. sense. Like when you know somebody's sorry, you don't want to. Can you forgive somebody that maybe doesn't feel like they deserve to be forgiven? I mean, these are all things that nobody really talks about in the film, but these are things I think about, you know. I mean, you know, you have to get to a certain point to be able to argue. Mm. Or maybe they're already past that point in a sense. Like, you know, in a sense they understand everything. And then, you know, either there's nothing else to say or they don't know what to say. period of figuring things out that I think it's almost, arguing is too easy sometimes, you know? <laughs> arguing is for the little stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, thank you thank so much you. for being with thank us you. today. It was a lovely film.